um, get started. Okay. Thank you everyone for coming out today. Um, it is a distinct pleasure for me to introduce our keynote speaker, um, Dr. Uh, Joao Pedro Maglais, whom we were able to spread away from the UK for a couple of days, so we're very pleased about that. Um, Dr. Magalhães is originally from Portugal, um, where he studied microbiology before heading to Belgium to pursue a PhD under the guidance of Dr. Olivier Toussaint at the University of Namur. And it was here that he began laying the foundation um, for all his uh, systems and comparative biological research approach. Um, his dissertation project encompassed both experimental and more um, computational data-driven research methods um, to understanding the processes underlying cellular senescence um, and response to oxidative stress, as well as the evolution of mammalian aging. Following his graduate studies, Dr. Morales then completed his postdoctoral research at Harvard with uh, genomics pioneer, George Church, and there he developed several high-throughput tools um, for studying aging. And in 2008, he joined the faculty of the University of Liverpool to start his own group using genomic approaches to studying aging and longevity. He has had a very productive research career there and has developed and continues to help maintain a collection of databases under the umbrella of um, the human aging genomic resources. And just as importantly, he has been an outspoken advocate for the study of aging. Um, for many of us in the program, uh, Dr. Morales' website, senescence.info, was probably one of the first resources we stumbled upon after being introduced to the idea of aging as a biological process. And then he demystifies um, a lot of basic concepts in aging, as well as academic research in general for the lay audience. And it's really hard to overstate the impact um, of this type of outreach. In fact, earlier this year, some of our newly accepted graduate students um, mentioned that they got here by following the steps outlined in the guide um, on how to become a biogerontologist, so, uh, which is about the school. So um, it's really fun and um, truly it is such a treat to have with us today a researcher whose efforts enrich the entire field in so many ways. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Magalhães. Well, thank you very much for those very kind words and, and introduction. And thank you, of course, for the invitation to come here. And, um, uh, and it's, it's a pleasure to be back here in San Antonio. Um, and it's about pleasure to tell you a little bit about um, how we work. Um, so I'll start with a, um, a fairly broad introduction to the biology and genetics of aging. And I'm aware some of it will be known to some of you. Um, but given that this is a student symposium, I thought I, I would start with uh, at least some of the basics of what we know and what we don't know about the biology and genetics of aging. Uh, and then I'll tell you a bit more about some of the works we've been doing, um, particularly at the uh, level of systems biology and uh, genomics of aging. So, now normally one of the things I do mention um, when I give a talk at another institution is I try to convince people how important it is to study the process of aging. Um, I thought I, I wouldn't do that today. I thought you said I would just show a cartoon because for a talk at the Barshop Institute, um, I assume you're already convinced of the importance of studying aging. Um, if you're not, please come and see me afterwards and I, I will be happy to educate you on that. Um, now, that said, of course, the idea that we grow old and that we develop diseases and we die um, and trying to fight that is not new. There's been um, numerous men throughout from since time immemorial, they've been trying to find an elixir of youth or some, some cure for aging or some uh, way of achieving immortality. Um, so a couple of examples. So one example will be Qin Qin Huang, who was the first emperor of the Qin Dynasty in China. And he tried to achieve immortality by taking pills uh, prepared by the court physicians of the time, which unfortunately for him were mostly made up of mercury. Uh, 
which we now know is toxic, and so sadly and ironically, he died of mercury poisoning. Um, now, another example is uh, Alexander Bogdanov, who was uh, a Russian uh, physician. Uh, he was uh, quite an interesting character. He was uh, a Bolshevist. He was involved in the Russian Revolution. He was a friend of Lenin. Um, and he is, as far as I know, the first scientific approach to trying to achieve rejuvenation, um, to try to, to uh, stop the process of aging. Um, so he had this, this physiological model, um, and he tried to achieve rejuvenation by taking injections of blood from, in particular from younger individuals, uh, which he claimed that he worked for a while, uh, until one day he, he received a blood transplant from a young student who had uh, tuberculosis and malaria. Um, and suddenly he did not survive. Uh, and of course he didn't know about things like blood compatibility at the time. Um, but that is, as far as I know, the first at least scientific basis um, to achieving rejuvenation um, and to achieving immortality. And of course, as I, I'm sure you are aware, there's quite a lot of work now on the beneficial slash rejuvenating uh, benefits of young blood. So it is, so maybe in a way, he was along the right track. Now, of course, science and technology have progressed quite a lot since then. Um, and to give you one example from England, where I live now, let me introduce you to King Edward I. Um, he was the, the king of England, mostly in the um, 13th century. Now, him and his first wife, Isabella, they had 16 children. And that's quite unusual for our standards. Now, we take a lot of things for granted. Um, and certainly for, a, for someone, for a woman to have 16 children was, is, is, would be very, very unusual nowadays. Um, but what's even more tragic is that if when you look at the, what happened to those children, the, the 11 daughters they had, six died before the age of three, and only five of them reached adulthood. When you look at his sons, only one, who would become King Edward II, survived to adulthood. Now, I, I show this because, first of all, we take a lot of things for granted in our current um, lifestyle, um, and there are things used to be a lot worse uh, in the good old days. And I would say, I would argue that curbing childhood mortality has been the greatest achievement of, of technology, of civilization. I mean, there were various advances. Uh, it was not just one discovery, but it is the greatest triumph of our civilization. Um, now, of course, the next step is to tackle the process of aging um, and to at least mitigate its consequences and effects. Um, and what I, I hope to persuade you today is that in the same way there were various technological advances that led to the, the curbing of childhood mortality, um, there's a number of ongoing scientific advances and breakthroughs that we can use to at least better understand and intervene in the process of human aging. Uh, but let me start, first of all, by defining the process of aging. Um, and uh, of course, I'm sure you're familiar with the process of aging, but uh, I think it's quite striking in these uh, Czech centenarians. Um, and my definition of aging um, is it's somewhat related to the definition from Alex Comfort. It's a definition I've been using for many years, which is that aging is a progressive deterioration of physiological function accompanied by an increase in vulnerability and mortality with age, which is a very fairly broad definition. As I'm sure you're aware, aging encompasses is a complex process that encompasses changes at various biological levels, molecular, cell, physiological, functional, um, and pathological changes, um, and that affects virtually every organ in the body. Um, now, unfortunately, one of the things I find frustrating has been being working in the field for, well, nearly 20 years and been interested in the field for over 20 years, uh, is that we still do not understand why we age. Why do human beings age? Uh, what is the ultimate cause of aging uh, at, the molecular, uh, at the molecular level? Um, there's a number of theories. I'm sure you're familiar with many of them. But we don't have a proven uh, mechanistic cause of aging. That said, there is reasons to be um, optimistic. So, I mean, one example and one uh, aspect of aging that I've always been fascinated about is, is that there are species that appear not to age, what 
Kirk Finch called species exhibiting negligible senescence. Uh, and this includes um, you know, species, some species of fish. So this is a particular kind of fish called the rockfish of the genus Sebastus. Um, you have certain types of these are recently discovered cave dwelling salamanders, so amphibians. Uh, you have certain reptiles like the Galapagos tortoise and painted turtles. Uh, so these species appear not to age. Um, and painted turtles are quite interesting animals. We actually saw some earlier today, and um, you can have them as pets. Uh, I actually used to have painted turtles as pets. Uh, unfortunately for them, I also used to have cats. <laughs> and although they are immune to aging, they are not immune to um, cunning, clawed predators. Um, now what I mean by immune to aging is that this species, they don't exhibit um, an increase in mortality with age. Um, in this, even in studies spanning decades, they don't exhibit an, any noticeable physiological decline. Um, and in some species, not all of them, um, they exhibit an increased reproductive output with age. So I think fishes is the best example of that. So s well, some species of fishes, they grow throughout their lives. So, you know, older females are going to lay more eggs, so their reproductive output is going to increase. Um, which some people have argued that evolution makes sense for these animals not to age. Uh, although I should say that's not universal. So, I mean, painted turtles do grow, um, but there are species of uh, animals exhibiting natural senescence that do reach a fixed site and don't appear to grow any longer. Um, now, I've always, as I said, I mean, since I became interested in aging um, many years ago, I've always found this species fascinating. First of all, because it shows that aging is neither universal nor inevitable. Um, and it's always been an inspiration for me. You know, in the same way, you know, the, the uh, birds were an inspiration to, to the Wright brothers. You know, because birds show that you know, heavier than air flying um, machines are possible. Because you know, birds, they can do that. So there's, there's no law of physics that means it's impossible. Likewise, this species shows that um, it is possible to avoid the process of aging. Um, now, of course, the question people ask me about species with negligible senescence is, okay, you know, the studies, there have been studies for decades, 50 years on this species, but, you know, maybe after 500 years they do age. Obviously, there's been no studies over 500 years. I mean, it's hard enough to get PhD students focused on four-year projects. Um, but there has been studies that show that, at the very least, they age so much slower than us that it's unnoticeable to us. So, at the very least, these species age much, much slower than us. And if natural selection can do that, then in principle, so can we. So can we retard the process of aging. Now, the other reason to be uh, optimistic is that, as I'm sure many of you are aware, the, the process of aging is uh, surprisingly plastic in uh, animal models. Um, so, I mean, the first gene, um, single gene or single, genet single allele identified um, to, to modulate lifespan was H1, which was identified by Tom Johnson and colleagues uh, in the roundworm C. elegans. Um, and we now know of many other cases. Um, and so we now know that aging can be manipulated by genes and by dietary interventions. And that, that's been, I think that's been a, a, a revolution in the field in the past 20 years, uh, particularly at the genetic level. Um, so, I mean, one of the things that, that Catherine mentioned uh, is that we, we maintain uh, this was a, a project that I started as a side project uh, when I was a PhD student, so it was never a part of my PhD thesis, for instance, uh, which is the Human Aging Genomic Resources, which is a collection of different databases um, and tools, mostly databases, for research on the biology and genetics of aging. And I think arguably they are the benchmarks in, in the field now. They have hundreds of citations. Uh, they've been highlighted in a number of journals and so on. Um, so. Um, so this, um, if you, when you look at the genetic level, uh, our main database is a genius database of uh, aging-related genes. And uh, this has also grown substantially since I started it uh, when I was a PhD student. So this is the, the latest version we have. And what I think is interesting is that we now know of over 2,000 genes in model systems, that is um, mice, flies, worms, and yeast. We know of over 2,000 genes that um, one manipulated in these animals by silencing, overexpression, mutations, and so on, they significantly affect aging and or longevity. So I think that's a, actually a tremendous advance in the field. 
um, you know, by, by, started by Tom Johnson, Cynthia Canyon, Gary Rufkin, and others. Um, and it actually wouldn't surprise me if it were to get the Nobel Prize uh, at some point. Um, and I mean, as you can see now, this, the, the, the impact of this mutation is significant. So for example, in worms, a single gene mutation, interestingly, is that a different allele of age one can increase lifespan by tenfold. So you have these tiny microscopic worms that instead of living uh, a few weeks, they live several months, which is remarkable. Um, and even in mice, of course, mice worms are simpler compared to mice, but even in mice, you can have single gene manipulations that impact on aging significantly. Right? So the current record, I think it's um, one of the growth hormone receptors or releasing hormones is on the growth hormone pathway. Um, and you have animals that live 50% longer than, than normal. Um, and not only these animals live longer, but they live longer healthier. So a number of age-related pathologies are retarded in these animals, which of course is what's important. Because I, I don't think people just want to live to be 150, per se. They want to live to be 150 in good health. That, that's what people want. And that's what I think the field of biogerontology um, aims to do. So w what all of this shows is that you know, the g acts as a um, digital code of life. And even though it's very big, you know, the human genome is about 3 billion base pairs, um, very subtle changes in DNA sometimes changes in a single nucleotide can have a significant impact on aging. And so part of our goal of our lab and part of what I've um, set out to do several years ago is to, to try to decode the genome to try to understand how it regulates complex processes like, like aging, like longevity, and like age-related diseases as well. And uh, I mean, you can have examples from other fields. I'll just show one example. Um, of how you can have very single gene manipulations that can have a significant impact. So this was work by, uh, um, by a lab at the uh, University of Edinburgh in Scotland. And what they showed a couple of years ago is that if you, so you might be aware that the thymus um, naturally involutes um, in human beings, in mice. Um, so essentially this is a normal thymus um, and it basically shrinks, it, it involutes and there's other cellular changes and morphological changes as well. What they showed is that if you force expression of a single transcription factor um, in these mice, you can have, um, which is what you see here, you have at least partly regenerate a thymus that has been involuted. Uh, so what this shows is really that just that one single gene can have a tremendous impact, um, in this case, in the thymus involution. Um, and obviously there's other examples from other fields. And that's why partly we focus a lot on the genetic level, given that it ver sits very highly, or some genes can sit very highly from a hierarchical uh, perspective. So I guess the point so far, I'll take a message so far, that it is possible to manipulate aging, and aging is not just a collection of age-related diseases. Um, and while we cannot manipulate genes in human beings the same way we can in, in worms, you know, for example, by bombardment, um, or we can manipulate them in mice, um, in, human being, or, or in human beings, we may be able to manipulate genes by diet, um, by lifestyle, or maybe even by drugs. Um, and if we could do that to slow down the process of aging, it would have tremendous benefits. So, I mean, a lot of people have argued that even a slight delay of the process of aging would have tremendous medical benefits, which I, I'm, I'm sure, you know, given that this is the Barshop Institute, you would agree with. So that's what happens in animal models, but if you look at human beings, I think very briefly there is also evidence that genes can have a significant impact. I mean, one classical example is Werner syndrome, which is the best example of a, a segmental polaroid syndrome um, in which it resembles accelerated aging. And I mean, as you can see here, patients um, with this disease look much older than a chronological age. They also have an early onset of various diseases like cancer or some types of cancer actually, I, I should say, type 2 diabetes, cataracts and so on. So and, and this disease results from mutations in a single gene, the Werner syndrome gene. Um, so again, it shows that single gene mutations can have a significant impact on aging. I think interesting, I mean, I've, I've always had a, a soft spot for Werner syndrome. I did some work on Werner syndrome fibroblasts when I was a PhD student. Um, one of the interesting things about Werner syndrome is that the, the Werner syndrome protein is involved in, well, it's a heli helicase exonuclease involved in 
um, DNA damage responses and DNA repair. So it does point out how was the role of DNA damage in aging. So as I said before, we don't really know exactly why human beings age, but I think when you look at prodromal syndromes, it does give some hints that possibly DNA damage is important in aging and may be one of the key causal factors, if not the major causal factor um, in the process of human aging. Although again, that's not proven. Um, so this is accelerated aging. What about retirement human aging? Um, I'll show you an example uh, of a study uh, I'm sure many of you have seen before from uh, Walter Longo and Jaime Guevara Aguirre. Um, so, so this is Dr. Jaime Guevara Aguirre. And so they, the study focused on uh, small people, um, so which you can see here. Uh, and these um, individuals, they have a deficiency of the growth hormone receptor. Um, and uh, so if you knock out growth hormone receptor in mice, many of you I'm sure are aware, you have life extension of these animals. Um, as well a delayed process of aging. Um, and what they found in these individuals, um, most of all, the most interesting is that they appear to be very well protected from cancer. So the sample size is not that, that big, but you know, there's been no cancer death in these individuals with growth hormone receptor deficiency, as compared to their relatives in which you have about 20-25% uh, mortality from cancer, which is what you'd expect in a normal population. And it is what you expect in this room. So about 20, 25% of people in this room will die of cancer. Um, and about 50% of people in this room will develop cancer as well, which means, you know, if I sit here in the, kind of in the middle, you know, that means that everybody on this side, or maybe everybody, no, you, you guys invited me, so I'm not, so it will be everybody on this side, everybody here will develop cancer. Um, so I think it's, it's very remarkable that these individuals are so well protected from cancer. I think it's quite interesting as well that you know, a single gene change can confer such strong cancer resistance. Um, now, of course, the obvious question next is, okay, but are they long-lived? And the question is, no, they're not long-lived. They seem to have a high incidence of heart diseases, uh, of cardiovascular diseases to be more specific, um, and also neurological conditions. I mean, the way Walter explained it to me is that th because they're smaller, their arteries clog up faster with cholesterol. And so they develop um, cardiovascular diseases at a higher incidence. Um, so, you know, they're not long lived like, like mice. Um, they are protected <coughs> from a specific age related diseases. Um, which I think can tell us something about as well how translatable findings from uh, modern models are to human beings, which is something I'll, I'll come back um, in a little bit. So, uh, the other aspect, I guess, is. Uh, is on the genetics of human longevity, in that we have a very good understanding now of genetic basis of, of human aging, but what about genetics of human longevity? I'm sure you're familiar that you know, there are families in which longevity um, is more prevalent. I mean, Jean Kalma uh, would be a good example of that. She, so this is the oldest human being on record. She lived to be 122. Uh, and you think she would she live a very healthy lifestyle. Uh, well, instead, no, she, she actually smoked for most of her life. Uh, she was very fond of port wine from my hometown in Porto, in Portugal, uh, and she ate massive amounts of chocolate. Uh, so not the lifestyle you associate with the longest human being. Um, and when you look at other centenarians, um, you see similar trends in that there's very few lifestyle, lifestyle factors in common between them, but it tends to run in the family. They, you know, normally they have other members of their family that are long-lived. Uh, so there's clearly some heritable, some genetic component to it. Um, and there's been studies, for example, in twins estimating that longevity is moderately heritable in human beings, about 25%, but this increases with age. So, you know, what it means is that it's moderately heritable to be living to 70 or 80, in which case you should watch your lifestyle if you want to be a healthy 70 or 80 year old. But, you know, to become a, a centenarian or to live to 122 like Jean Calma, it's really about choosing your parents and grandparents. Um, now, one of the big, I think, question mark still in the field is what are the genetic determinants of, uh, of exceptional human longevity? And that's something that overall we don't understand well yet. I think there is a big gap in knowledge between our understanding of genetic manipulations of aging in animal models and uh, our understanding of the genetic basis of human longevity, which is very, very poor so far. Um, so that, that's where we are now. Um, that said, you know, there has been, again, going back to technological advances, there has been great advances in technology. Um, one of the, the major ones, which will focus on some of the projects we've been involved in this level of DNA sequencing, which have dropped considerably. So, 
I mean, this is a log scale, and so this is the cost of DNA sequencing. And as you can see, this is a whoops, there has been this massive drop in the cost of sequencing, which means that while the human genome, depending on how you do the calculations, costs you two, three billion dollars, you can now sequence your genome for a thousand dollars. And that means we can now sequence genomes, for example, of centenarians um, to try to discover what makes them unique. And, and that's something that we're doing. Uh, I mean, not necessarily me. I mean, this is actually me pretending I know what this machine does. <laughs> I don't. It just, you know, it had a lot of blinking lights. It looked really sci-fi sci and techy. So I took a picture next week, but I have no idea what it means. Um, well, what it also means, of course, is that we're generating lots and lots of data. Um, and really, one of the shifts, I guess, in paradigms in, in the life sciences, biological sciences, is that is from data generation to data analysis. It's very easy to generate large amounts of data. You can sequence genomes in a very high throughput way, um, but you have to then make sense of all the data. Um, you have to interpret it, you have to analyze it. And that's really the time constraints, and then that really is the bottleneck now in, in a lot of research being done. And then I'll mention a couple of examples of our own work on that. Um, so, so our lab at the University of Liverpool, um, so we, we do this combination of experimental and computational approaches. I mean, mostly experimental, we do uh, cell biology. I mean, I mean, I'm a cell biologist. I did my, my PhD in, uh, in cell biology and senescence, so I'm a cell biologist by training. Um, and I, we also do quite a lot of um, computational approaches from evolutionary genomics, systems biology, um, functional genomics, uh, and so on. So, I mean, <coughs> well, I'll mention a, a couple of examples of things we've done without going into a lot of uh, methodological detail, but you know, happy to answer questions or discuss in more detail later on. Now, I guess, um, and I mean, in addition to you, Liverpool, I also have an affiliation with the Center for Neurosciences at the University of Coimbra in Portugal, where we do mostly studies on uh, um, Alzheimer's disease uh, and neurodegeneration, although I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, so I guess one of the, the bases for systems biology and for doing computational analysis is that we now know, well, people have argued, but we know that um, you know, genes don't work in isolation. They, they work by interacting with each other and with the environment. And so the challenge now is to determine how genes interact with each other in the environment to determine a given phenotype. You know, it could be longevity, aging, or it could be really many other complex phenotypes. Uh, so you really need to, to understand the whole from its parts by studying the components of the systems and their interactions. Um, and that's what a lot of, a lot of the approaches that we've been employing focused on. Uh, so I'll give you a, a couple of examples. So one, uh, one example is at the level of network analysis. So we've been doing a lot of network biology and network analysis applied to aging and its manipulations. Um, I'll show you a couple of examples. I mean, the simplest one is just a, uh, what's called a guilt by association approach, which is if you have a network, so imagine each of these is a protein, so, and these are proteins associated with aging, for example, from our genetic database, and you have proteins unstudied in the context of aging. Um, proteins unstudied in the context of aging that interact with many proteins associated with aging, in turn, are more likely to be related to aging. Um, and that was something I actually did um, back when I was a, a, a PhD student, um, and then later we, together in collaboration with Gary Rufkun uh, and Sean Cohen, um, we tested or they tested this experimentally in C. elegans. And uh, I mean, what they've done was basically, we published this a couple of years ago, so I won't go into many details, but they tested about 400 candidate genes using RNAi approaches, and they tested this in worms. And they found about 13 times more longevity genes than would be expected with a random screen. Uh, in particular, life extending genes, which is good or it's reassuring because we have a lot more life extending genes to begin with so it makes that that's good it means we're not just killing worms and making them uh, have a shorter lifespan we actually identify longevity genes um, so this showed us this kind of network guided approaches can provide biological insights and can help guide experiments and of course they've been applied to other processes and systems as well um, now the other thing we've done is try to decrease the complexity of the, of the data. So to give an example for our genome database, a couple of years ago, we decided to split genes not just as aging and longevity associated, but into pro or anti-longevity genes. I mean, there's a third category, but it's only me, so I won't go into it. 
So a pro-longevity gene would be a, a gene in which if you decreases expression, it reduces lifespan, or if you overexpression, it extends lifespan. So, so that would be an example. So the Werner syndrome gene would be an example because if, you, um, if there's a mutation in it, it reduces lifespan. Well, an anti-longevity gene would be the opposite. You know, decreased expression, extend lifespan. So the growth hormone receptor would be an example because if you knock it out in mice, you reduce its expression or you knock it out, uh, it extends lifespan. So that would be anti-longevity. Um, so that was one way of better categorizing while we you know this, we have these over 2,000 genes associated with aging, and we wanted to start to better categorizing to better make sense of, of them. Um, and then the other thing you can do then as well is you can try to group them by, by functions or pathways. Um, so, I mean, this is a very brief example. We, we did quite a lot of work on this, but this, so this is just pro and anti longevity genes in worms um, and how they fit different pathways. Um, and for example, you see that a lot of the anti longevity genes. Um, fit into translation, which makes sense because we know that if you inhibit translation in worms, um, it extends lifespan, or it frequently extends lifespan. Um, you see autophagy, for example, associated with pro-longevity, which again is uh, according to what we expect, um, and so on. And I mean, we did this for other model systems, but I, I won't go into that. The point is that we can use this type of classification and this kind of analysis to reduce from hundreds and hundreds of genes into groups that we can then better interpret biologically. Um, so that's, that's the point of doing this kind of analysis, which we can also do to other, other processes and in other circumstances. Um, then <coughs> one more recent analysis that we've done was focusing on what we called the gerontome, which is basically the collection of aging-related genes, and um, particularly from our genetics database, and then analyze it in a systematic way for various kinds of trends. So, so we actually did some analysis in terms of functional pathways, you know, which, which pathways are more associated with prolonental longevity. Um, it was not very different from what I just showed you, but we did it for other model organisms if you're interested. Um, and we also looked at a, a few aspects that we thought could be interesting. So one of the first things we looked at evolutionary conservation. People tend to say, well, aging related genes tend to be evolutionary conserved because, you know, we find some of the same pathways in worms, in drosophila, and in mice. So we did show at the molecular, uh, what's the term, molecular evolution rate level that aging related genes are more evolutionary conserved than would be expected by chance. Um, now, one of the things we wanted to look was the level up between aging and age related diseases. So we have genes associated with aging, and we can get genes associated with different age related diseases. How much do they overlap? And do they overlap more than expected by chance? Um, and what we found is that there is overlap, but it's very species specific. So, so let me show you. So this is the different species. So this is mice, flies, worms, and yeast. And these are various diseases. And this you have here, anti and pro longevity. And as you can see in mice, there is quite a lot of overlap. Um, there's a little bit of overlap in Drosophila, and there's practically no overlap in worms and, and yeast. So this overlap between aging and age related diseases is very species specific, um, in particular in the species that are more evolutionary closer to humans, like mice, but not so much in species that are evolutionary distant, like C. elegans and, and yeast. Um, we then also looked specifically what was driving these associations um, between aging and age related diseases. And what seems to occur is that the, they are driven by a small fraction of aging related genes. I, in, in other words, if I can go back for a minute, um, it's not diff it tends to be common genes between the different diseases that tend to also be associated with aging. Um, and in particular genes related to inflammation, you know, like interleukins, uh, uh, TNF, um, and so on. Uh, and when we look at the network perspective as well, these genes tend to be hubs in networks. In other words, they tend to be genes like this that interact with a, not a lot of other proteins in the network. Um, so these links between aging and age-related diseases, they seem to be species-specific, and they seem to be driven by a small clusters of genes related to inflammation. Well, not all of them are related to inflammation. Some of them are related to inflammation, um, but they tend to be hubs in networks. So when you look at the network level, they tend to be hubs with lots of different connections. Um, so that, that's what we found. Um, there is one thing, however, uh, I would like to worry about if you're thinking of doing any kind of systematic large-scale analysis, which is researcher biases. 
So, well, GeneAge would be a good example. So GeneAge, of course, is a reflection of what people have, scientists, you know, like many of you, have discovered uh, about, uh, about aging. But of course, researchers don't decide on which gene to study on a purely um, arbitrary way. They don't go, oh, you know, there's 20,000 genes in the genome. Oh, I'm going to pick this one for my study. They don't do that. They select genes, usually genes that have been identified as associated with aging in other species. So there is some researcher biases that is very difficult to quantify in the underlying data sets. Um, and when you're using large data sets like this ones, that can be an issue. Uh, and so, for example, I mentioned earlier that aging-related genes tend to be more evolutionary conserved than expected by chance. I don't know if that's, that could be due, at least in part, to researcher biases. Uh, and that is, that is a problem, I think, in this kind of systems biology analysis. Um, and we did, we actually did some quantification of, uh, um, so for example, you know, uh, proteins that tend to have hubs, tend to have more interactions, also have, tend to have more studies associated with them. Um, but then there's a bit of a bias because if a protein has been more studied, then it makes sense it has more interactions. So there that, that could be biases there as well. Uh, so that's just something, al although I think some of the strengths, um, and we did correct for some aspects uh, of publication biases, and they remain, there are some aspects of this systematic analysis um, that are susceptible to researcher biases. Um, now the other area we've, uh, we've focused as well in terms of employing some of this systems biology and genomics approaches is in studying caloric restriction. Now, <coughs> for many of you are familiar, most of you I would expect are familiar with caloric restriction. If you're not familiar, just very briefly. So this was discovered by Clive McKay and colleagues um, at, at Cornell. And uh, I mean, one way you feed animals or rats, I think they did this initially in rats, um, they fed ad libitum. That means they can eat as much as they want. If you reduce the amount of calories they eat, um, you'll see a life extension. Um, this data, I actually think, is actually here from San Antonio. I think this is data from Edward Masoro. It's not from Clive McKay. Clive McKay data is actually not very good. It probably wouldn't be published today. It was it's really sloppy data, um, which is interesting because it turned out to be accurate. Um, so, so this is the effect of caloric restriction, and it's I'm sure you're familiar. Uh, one of the most established ways of extending lifespan in animals. So we've been trying to apply some of our knowledge uh, or some of our expertise to, to caloric restriction. I should say, I don't think that caloric restriction would be as effective in humans as it is in rodents. And I don't think you would see this in human beings if we could put, um, if we could put uh, human beings in a caloric restriction in a controlled environment. Um, I don't think you see that, but I think it can help identify drug targets. Um, I mean, there's, we, we've heard earlier today already some works on rapamycin, which targets TOR, and some have argued is a caloric restriction mimetic. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the work on resveratrol that appears to target 31. Um, and I think that's important because, um, first of all, even if caloric restriction doesn't have a tremendous, doesn't have as big impact in humans as in mortal systems, it's still uh, likely to have benefits in human beings. Um, so for example, in terms of cancer protection, I think there's very good evidence even for monkeys that caloric restriction protects against cancer. So the goal is to develop some molecules, some drug that has the benefits of caloric restriction without having to go on a diet. Um, I mean, and this is a, a model from a review we did a couple of years ago on, on pathways involved in caloric restriction. Um, so we've been trying to apply our methods to caloric restriction and we employ different network analysis and multidimensional data integration. So, so what we did here, so we've had a, a protein interaction data, um, sorry, protein interaction data that we turn into a, a network, which is what you see here. But then we also generated gene expression data. And uh, it's actually data from yeast. So we have gene expression data from yeast. So we know which genes are being upregulated and downregulated in caloric restriction. And so we can use that information to basically segregate our network into stimulated and suppressed interactions. So we, again, we can reduce the complexity of the underlying data sets. We can further discriminate it into uh, smaller subnetworks of stimulated and suppressed interactions. We can give better than predictions uh, for functional analysis uh, and for experiments. So we've actually employed some of these network analysis to predict new caloric restriction mimetic genes, which we tested experimentally, or I should say, um, this the, 
this work was mostly done by Daniel Wittke, who I in my lab, who did the bioinformatics, but then the experimental validation was done by, uh, in the lab of uh, Fusheng Tang in Arkansas. So again, this is an example of employing network approaches to reduce the complexity of the data and to gather biologically significant insights that we then tested experimentally. Now the other angle um, that we've been using again is, is using technology and next generation sequencing for uh, uh, whole transcriptome sequencing or RNA-seq. So we've employed this um, in a couple of different projects. Um, I guess the first one was um, just to profile um, brain aging in rats. Uh, so this was, you know, we published this a couple of years ago, but I'll just highlight, this was an interesting work I thought because we found a lot of them are differently expressed, uh, not just genes, but what is called dark matter transcripts. So these are transcripts that do not map to known exons. And we found them differentially expressed uh, in the aged brain of rats uh, using RNA-seq, which of course you wouldn't be able to detect with a traditional microarrays. So it's a good example of the use of, of whole transcriptome sequencing to gather insights or to gather potentially interesting genes that you wouldn't be able to find uh, with normal microarrays. Uh, and we even found novel genes being expressed. That is, genes that are not on ensemble or NCBI, they're not even on the uh, genome annotations that we found expressed in our samples. Um, so that's, I think that's a good example of the use of RNA-seq to, um, to profile um, or to gather insights you wouldn't find with traditional microarrays. Um, but going back to colonic restriction, <coughs> we recently um, did a, a large-scale analysis of RNA-seq of caloric restriction. Um, and we found, I mean, we found a lot of different expressed genes, which I won't go into details here. Um, you know, things related to neuroprotection, epigenetic modulation, that was a very big theme, um, oxidative stress response, and so on. But then one of the things we did is that we had different rats, um, different rat groups that were on caloric restriction for different times, and they were switched between caloric restriction and ad libitum. Uh, and they had different lifespans. So we were able to use these dietary switches to identify genes that were differentially expressed only specifically in diet-induced life extension. So I found this group, I think, was a little over 100 genes that are significantly uh, differentially expressed only when you have diet-induced life extension um, that we, we're now trying to follow up on. Um, so uh, the other thing we did is we did a, a specific experiment on microRNA. So I'm, I'm not sure how familiar you are with RNA-seq, but so normally, so I mean, depending on how you do the sequencing, I mean, there's different protocols, but the way we did it, which is um, with ribosomal depletion um, method, you do get a lot of known coding RNAs from your data. So a lot of, we find not just um, protein encoding genes being differentially expressed, but find, we find a lot of link RNAs, that's uh, long known coding RNAs. We found a, a lot of other types of known coding RNAs in our data as well. But then if you want to look specifically at microRNAs, um, you need to do a, sp a, a specific run for microRNAs, which is what we did. So you do a separate RNA extraction for, or you take some sp special, just an aliquot of RNA, and you prepare a library just for uh, profiling microRNAs. Um, and we only found actually one, so we did that all of that, we actually only found one microRNA, MO983P, um, that was differentially expressed. Uh, associated with, uh, with caloric restriction. Um, and it's been involved in, in neuroprotection and we actually did some in vitro follow-up in which we manipulated the, the microRNA um, to prove some of uh, that it was associated with um, the caloric restriction effects, although it is something we're still following up on. Um, so this is, again, an example of using these technologies to, to try to identify candidate genes there could be important players, in this case in caloric restriction, that you wouldn't be able to find with, uh, with traditional microarrays. Micro now, the other thing we've done um, that, we, that we finished up uh, last year was we have a lot of uh, gene expression profiles from caloric restriction. And I'm sure you're aware there's also um, gene expression profiles from drugs. A lot of them are publicly available, so you can just download gene expression profiles from drugs. So we asked the question of whether we could identify drugs that would overlap with the gene expression profiles of caloric restriction. 
Um, so, and hopefully that would give us some new uh, caloric restriction mimetic compounds. So we did that, and uh, it was interesting because the top drug was rapamycin. Now, I should say, we, we do a lot of large-scale approaches, large-scale scans and screens. And when you do something large-scale, so in the case of drugs, I think there was over a thousand drugs we were screening for. Um, when you do a large-scale, we were looking for overlaps with caloric restriction signatures. Um, when you do something large-scale like that, you're always going to find some hits. You know, there's always something in it. Um, the question is whether it's biologically significant or not. Um, so I wasn't too optimistic. I mean, this was a small project for, for a student in the lab. Um, but when, when it showed that the top drug was rapamycin, I thought, well, you know, rapamycin, that's, that's been argued as a caloric restriction mimetic. So maybe, and it extends lifespan in flies um, and in mice. So maybe there is something to it. Um, so I decided to validate this in worms. So we did this in uh, what's called as E2 mutants. So these, are, so these are worms that have a defect in their larynx and they cannot eat as much as normal. And so they're, it's a genetic model of caloric restriction. So they live longer, um, they eat less and they live longer. Uh, so we used it as a model. So what we did is we feed um, the, our compounds to normal worms and we feed them to this E2 model. And we expect, or we hope, that some of the compounds will extend lifespan in the normal worms, but not in the uh, eat 2 mutants. So, I've got, and, and now to summarize, we published this last year, but of the five drugs we tested, four of them acted as caloric restriction mimetics. I mean, admittedly, one of them was rapamycin, which was a, a positive control. Um, the newest of them is a, is a compound called Alantoin, which is intriguing how it extends lifespan because it's a marker of oxidative stress. Um, so, it, I mean, there may be some hormesics effects there. We're not entirely sure. We are not fully aware. We're not even beginning to be aware of the mechanism um, by which a lantern extends lifespan in worms. Um, but what this shows, from a, again, from a systems biology perspective, this network pharmacology approach can, um, can provide biologically significant insights. You can use this computational analysis to identify genes associated, I'm sorry, identify drugs that have life extending properties. But of course, as well, I'm sure in our world there's a lot of compounds that extend lifespan. I mean, one of the things we've, um, well, it's now in press, is uh, a new database to our collection, and a new addition to our collection called the Drug Database of Aging Related Drugs. Um, and this has over 400 drugs, compounds, that extend lifespan in 27 mortal organisms. Of course, in particular in worms, yeast, flies, and mice. So there's lots, really lots of different compounds and drugs. Um, and there's really a, a lot of interest now in terms of pharmacological manipulations of aging. I'm sure you know, we've heard already about rapamycin today, um, and I'm sure you're aware of studies as well in metformin and resveratrol. So that is, a, I think, a very timely um, topic in terms of intervening in aging from a pharmacological perspective. And it's not surprising that you know, there's big companies like you know, Calico funded by Google that are coming into the field of aging. I think it's a very exciting time to work in the field of aging. Um, that said, I mean, I said I would come back to the importance of animal models. Uh, one of the things I've always, so I mentioned before we have this shift. We have this very good, or we have this good understanding of how aging is regulated in animal models. We know of there's over 2,000 genes, um, but we have a very poor understanding of what are the genetic determinants of human longevity. Um, and really, most of the genes, if not all of the genes associated with aging and longevity model systems, they have not been identified, or at least not consistently associated with, um, with human longevity. I mean, there, there are some studies showing IGF-1 receptor, but that's, that's not really been validated in other populations, so it's, it's not clear to me that that's the case. Um, so, to me, that raises questions about what's the relevance of, uh, of human of model systems, in particular model animal models, to human beings. Um, and I would say that there's a couple of problems. I mean, one of the <coughs> biggest problems, of course, is that most of the studies we do in, uh, in animal models, we do it with genetically homogeneous strains. I mean, I know there are exceptions like the ITP, but most of it, for example, in worms, is done with the N2 strain, which is a genetically homogeneous animal. Um, on the other hand, human beings, we have a lot um, variation, genetic variation, of course, environmental variation. So, while observed in animal models, uh, short-lived animal models, 
um, may not always, or may not even in most cases, be relevant to human beings. Um, one, because of the greater genetic and environmental variability of human beings, um, and secondly, because of course, these are short-lived model systems. Um, one of the things from our analysis of drug age is that you know, the, the closer you are to humans evolutionary, you know, the smaller the effect sizes, which is something we see at the genetic level as well. I mentioned you can extend lifespan tenfold in worms, but only about 50% in mice. Um, so this is, you have here different organs, so mice, flies, and worms, and this is the lifespan change, and this is uh, just, the, so the height represents the number of compounds in that particular class. And as you can see, you know, in worms you have a bigger range, you have compounds that increase lifespan quite a lot, in flies a little bit less, and in mice it's quite a narrow range. I mean, you don't really have lifespan effects that are that big in mice from, from different compounds. So, Again, that raises questions. I mean, we don't know where humans would stay. We don't know why that would be the case. Probably would be much less effects. And so I do think there are still question marks about the use of animal, short-lived animal models um, to study the, the human aging process and how translatable those are. That's one of the reasons I'm excited about, you know, studies on dogs and, uh, and marmosets and other animal models that I think um, may be uh, more relevant to human beings. Although, of course, they have other problems. Um, as well. And of course there's the problem of genetic heterogeneity. I think that's, you know, what works for, for some people may not necessarily be for others. Um, so for example, for caloric restriction, you know, it might work for some individuals. I mean, I can certainly think of some people who should go on a diet, um, but not necessarily for other human beings. Now in the last, um, in the last part of my talk, I'll focus on a, a different topic, um, and that is the diversity in the pace of aging, which you know, I look at about species that um, appear not to age, um, but there's also, even when you look at species that age, like mammals, there's a huge diversity um, in, in longevity and in paces of aging in mammals. Um, so, you know, mice and rats live three, four years. In mean, recent monkeys can live over 40 years. I mean, humans, 122 from Jean Calma, and at the end of the spectrum, we have whales that can live over 200 years. So there's, there's a huge variation in longevity amongst mammals. That, I've always found that fascinating. Um, how you see, you know, how, I mean, a mouse, no, no matter how well you take care of it, is going to age 20, 30 times faster than a human being. Um, so there has to be some genetic basis to it. Um, and, I mean, these differences are not due to metabolic rates. I know there's this old idea that higher metabolic rates, um, for example, in mice, correlate with uh, faster aging process, faster damage generation, faster aging process, the so-called rate of living theory. But I mean, we and others, I mean, Steve Ostad, who used to be here, I mean, he showed that bats and birds have very high metabolic rates and yet they live a very long time. So, um, and using more, um, more recent um, statistical methods, we showed that there really, are, there really is no correlation between metabolic rates and longevity in mammals or birds. Um, I mean, I wasn't gonna show that, but I'm happy to discuss later if you wish. So I've been interested in diversity of pace of aging, and we've also been interested in exceptionally long-lived animals. Um, so one of those animals, um, which of course you have here, um, you're lucky enough to actually have some of these animals. Uh, one of these animals is the naked mole rat. Um, so I'm sure many of you are familiar, they're the longest-lived rodent, they can live over 30 years, and they're um, highly cancer-resistant, although there's been some cases of cancer. So one of the things we did uh, a few years ago in collaboration with the Broad Institute, Harvard, MIT, um, Vera Gordonova, Rochester, and so on, was we sequenced the naked mole rat genome, and we generated this other um, database called the Naked Mole Rat um, Genome Resource. And I mean, you probably notice a trend in my talk that you know we generate a lot of databases and resources. Uh, but I mean, that goes a bit to what Catherine was saying earlier. That uh, you know, I think I mean, I think every scientist in the world should be working on aging. Um, and so I want to make it as easy as possible for scientists to work on aging and for scientists to work on a naked mole rat. So by making um, a resource, you know, scientists who are, may not necessarily be working on aging directly, but you know, if they're interested in cancer or working on some protein associated with cancer, they can at least try to bring some other insights from naked mole rats into their research. And I, I want to make that as easy as possible. Um, and I should also say, I mean, I'm, I'm big uh, um, advocate of, of open science, you know, and um, open publications, open data, and sharing of data um, to, to everyone. I think that's how you advance the field, because there's only so much we can do. 
So that's what we've done in, in the making mode. I mean, I should say, so the actual genome was sequenced at the Broad Institute in, in Boston, well, in Cambridge. Um, that's the shoe sets. Um, but we did um, um, the analysis and we set up this, this resource for helping the community study naked movements. Now, the other um, bigger project was uh, sequencing the bullhead whale genome. So, bullhead whales are the second heaviest animal on Earth after the blue whale, uh, and they've been estimated to live over 200 years. Um, now of course, you know, they, you know, they don't have ID cards or throw birthday parties, so how do we know they live over 200 years? Um, so, first of all, there is some anecdotal evidence. There's been uh, harpoons discovered on animals dated back over 100 years. Um, and there was uh, a study by um, Craig George and our, our we, with whom we collaborated in this project, and they estimated the age of these animals using a you know, biochemical assay. Basically, it, it uses racemization ratios in the eye lenses of the animals that have very low turnover, and so you just calibrate it with known animals of known age, and then you extrapolate to the oldest animals you can find. And there is an error margin associated with it. The oldest animal is over 200 years, according to the estimates. I'm not convinced that, that, that these animals can live over 200 years, but I am convinced that they can live longer than human beings. Uh, and of course, they live longer than human beings in the wild, we, we know, without, um, without going to the doctor or to a hospital. So they must be protected uh, from age-related diseases. Um, and in particular, about cancer, I mean, if you think of cancer as you know, one rogue cell proliferating uncontrollably, then these animals that have a thousand times more cells than human beings should, all things being equal, die of cancer early in life. Uh, but of course, they don't, so, because they live so long. So they must have some mechanisms to protect against cancer. Um, so that's why we decided to focus on these animals um, and, and to sequence their genome. Now, I won't go into great details on how you sequence a genome, in, but just to give a, a flavor of what it involves. Um, so a genome is about 3 billion base pairs. We sequence about 150 coverage. That means we, we sequence about 150 times on average. Of course, some, it's all random. So we cut the genome, we cut the DNA into small pieces, and we sequence those until we have about 450 gigabytes of data. And then you have all of these small fragments, um, and you have to put them all together like this massive jigsaw puzzle. Um, and we run that on the, um, I think we did that on a particular server from the university, not our servers, um, because it has to run on a particular kind of computer. We run that, and we put it together like this, yeah, it's like gigantic jigsaw puzzle, uh, which takes a little bit of time. Um, and as I said, it, it requires a really, really good computer. Um, and then we have a genome, and uh, the genome is about 2.3 gigabytes, um, base pairs, and we annotate about 23,000 proteins, which is kind of similar to the other whale genome that was available at the time, which was the minke whale. Um, now, once we have the genome, uh, we compare it to other similar genomes, like the minke whale, like the killer whale. I mean, killer whale, for those who don't know, is not actually a whale, it's a dolphin, but so we compare it to the minke whale, was the only other whale that we had a genome from, but we had um, we had a couple of, uh, of other cetaceans. We had uh, um, the killer whale, and we had a one more. Um, I think it was a type of dolphin as well. And of course, to other mammals. And the idea is to find something new in a bowhead. You know, genes that have some sort of change or alteration that seems interesting. Um, so that, that seems unique to the bowhead whale. Um, and we found some promising candidates, not a huge amount. I mean, the, the bowhead whale genome is not radically different from the minke whale genome. Um, but we found some changes that occur only in the bowhead well in some genes associated, known to be associated with cancer and aging. Um, you know, like uh, histone deacetylases, I um, mean, ERCC1, which is involved in, in DNA repair and DNA damage responses. Um, I believe if you, I think if you knock it out in mice, you'll have these prodroid mice. Um, proliferating cell nuclear antigen, uh, which is associated with cancer. Um, so, to give an example, I think this is from PCNA. So in green you see the protein, and then in red you, you have residues that are different in a bowhead whale. And these are residues that are not present in any other mammal. Um, and we did a 3D model, uh, and when we compare it uh, to other mammals, um, it seems to affect an interaction of the PCNA protein with another protein called FAN1, which is also associated with cancer. Um, so that's one of our predictions. I mean, of course, this is computational. We haven't tested it experimentally. Um, but we derived several of these computational predictions for what may be making the bowhead whales unique. Um, and then, it will probably not surprise you that we did make a database out of it. Um, and the name is the Bowhead Whale Genome Resource. Um, 
So again, I try to make it that you know other people use this research and use this data for their own research. That that's really what I want. I mean, there's not there's only so much we can do in terms of analysis. Um, so what I want is other people to use this resource for uh, for experiments or for analysis. Um, and in a way, I mean, the naked mole rat and the bowhead whale, I, I see them as these disease-resistant organisms that are complementary to existing models. Uh, so if you think of models like mice and rats, these are models of disease. That is, they develop diseases uh, at the higher incidence or earlier onset than human beings. So they're good for discovering mechanisms and genes associated with disease. But animals like the bowhead whale and the naked mole rat, I think they're powerful paradigms to identify genes and processes and pathways that protect against disease, um, which is complementary to what um, to what existing models do. So, I mean, I'm not saying we should stop doing research on mice and rats. I'm saying that we should also use these other complementary models. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I mean, we will have um, no rats in here. Um, and ultimately, you know, the idea or the goal would be to translate some of these findings into human beings or to have some applications. And we do have examples of applications from animals, you know, animal innovations that we apply for human medicine. Um, and I mean, I, I'm obviously very much aware that it's harder to translate something you discover in a bowhead well into humans than something that you discover in rats or mice. I'm aware of that. But then again, the effect sizes you see are greater because you might, if you discover something truly new, that it might have a greater impact. Um, <clears throat> and how do I see us translating these findings from from these long-lived organisms into humans. Well, the obvious would be something like a pharmacological approach. So if you discover some DNA change in a mole rat that confers some sort of uh, cancer protection, um, you might be able to discover or to target pharmacologically that protein and discover drugs that do the same thing uh, without doing genetic modification. So that mimic the genetic change of the mole rat or of the bowhead whale. Um, and what do you think far ahead? I mean, maybe we'll be able to develop gene therapy approaches based on what we discover in these outlier animals. So again, I'm not saying we should abandon all other research, but I do think this is a complementary approach um, to, to biomedical research. Um, and I mean, one of the things that I've never made any secret about is that I don't work on aging just because I'm interested in it. I think it's a fascinating problem. I, w I think it's very interesting, but I also think black holes are very interesting. Um, and yet, I'm not going to work on black holes because I'm never going to be able to do anything on them. So I would like to work, or I would like my work to have some sort of um, the applications. Uh, I would like one day when I'm retired, I would like to go to a pharmacy and say, you know, you see that thing over there? Yeah, the, yeah, the blue box. Yeah, I developed that, or I helped develop it. That's what I would like to do when I finish my career. I don't just want to count my grants and papers um, and say that's what I did. I want to actually develop something in the end. So that, that's what I, that's the goal of my research, is to intervene in the process of aging or help develop some interventions to the process of aging. Um, I mean, in this context, um, I, I will very briefly tell you a story, and this was done with, with Randy, and well, as part of the interventions testing program. Um, and so a few years ago, well, oh, I'm getting old, this was over 10 years ago now. Um, so over 10 years ago, um, we did this uh, analysis of basically demographic analysis um, of different genetic mutants and interventions in aging. I, I won't bore you with the details, but the, the take home message is that this is fish oil. And here you have controls, and you have, you have animals that have been fed fish oil. And what this suggests is that the slope of the curve is different when you feed them fish oils. Um, and it suggests that the demographic rate of aging is being slowed down when you feed animals fish oil. Uh, which I thought was unusual, because I was thinking this would be a kind of negative control for this paper, and it turned out not to be a negative control at all. So, so I, th I was intrigued by that, um, but this was done in, um, in a particular short-lived um, strain. Uh, so I think it was New, New Zealand Black, uh, which is a, I think is an, a model of autoimmune diseases. So probably people in the room will know more about this than I do. Um, so I put in together a small team of collaborators and we proposed this to the interventions testing program, um, which we, we published with, with Rennie and many others last year. Um, unfortunately, there doesn't appear to be any effect from fish oil on the lifespan of animals. So, I mean, there were two dosages tested, 1.5% and 5% fish oil, and as you can see, there is no effect. You have controls on fish oil, and there's no 
no effect for fish oil in the lifespan of the mice as part of the interventions testing program. Now, I'm just showing you the males, but trust me, the, the, the female data is not more exciting than that. There's no effect whatsoever either. Um, so this turned out to be a negative result, but you know, I still think that's the kind of approach that is worthwhile to do. It's again, trying to develop interventions on aging. Um, and most things will fail, um, but if we can get something to work, then that will already be uh, revolutionary. That, that really is, um, that's really is been my dream from the beginning and my goal from the beginning. Um, so, I mean, given, and given that this was a, a, a student symposium, uh, I mean, this is a, a book I saw several years ago now. Um, I think it was done by an Australian nurse on the regrets of the dying. Um, so basically she asked people who were about to die what they regretted the most um, about their lives. Um, you know, and the top one is not following one's dreams. So, I mean, I can at least say that I will not say that um, when I'm on my deathbed. I am following my dream of trying to develop interventions for, uh, um, on aging. And I mean, if you're curious about the other ones, um, I mean, working too hard, probably I will regret that, yes. Uh, not expect, uh, I want you to know that I love you all. <laughs> um, so, I mean, there might be some, some interesting life lessons in that. So I, I, I actually recommend strongly this book. Um, there is one more thing I wanted to, to mention that Catherine briefly mentioned, which is I do a lot of work on outreach and I give a lot of talks to, you know, to schools and to uh, um, different lay audiences, which is about trying to increase awareness and understanding of the science of aging. So one of the things, so some of the research we've done got some attention in the media. Um, so one example was the, the genome of the bullhead whale, which was in a lot of different media outlets. Um, so, I mean, this is from Facebook, but that was in a lot of media outlets. So I did what, I guess, I, I think other people do, which is, of course, I went to look what people were commenting on regarding my research. And I was, you know, Googling my own name on Google News and trying to find what, what people were saying. Um, and it's quite, a, it's quite an interesting experience to see what, a lot, there were a lot of comments, I'll only show you a few, but, you know, what people say about this kind of work. So, you know, you have, the, you know, there are little jokes. <laughs> um, which is good. I mean, um, there's some really good ones. I c I'm not going to show them here today, but on the naked mole rat, because of how it looks, you know, there's some really good ones on the naked mole rat as well. <laughs> Trust me on that. You, you don't, you, <laughs> you don't know what you can find when you read the comment section of some uh, UK newspapers on, on naked mole rats. Um, but then you find some really serious concerns about research on aging. Um, you know, people, okay, why do you want to live longer? Why do you want to extend lifespan? Um, and I think that really is a problem. I mean, when, when I give talks um, for my audience, that's always those kind of questions. Um, so I, I'm aware that you know, people like Brian Kennedy and Philip Sierra, they've been uh, pushing for the geoscience agenda. You know, we focus on health span instead of lifespan. We don't just want people to live longer, we want people to be disease free. Um, which I think is really important. Um, but we still, so I, I do think we still have, as a field, we have to do a, a better job at that. And that's part of the goal of having a website and do, giving talks on, on this topic is to educate the public and lay audiences that, you know, it's not just about life extension in a period of decrepitude, it's about life extension with good health. We're trying to prevent people from becoming sick. Really, that's what it is. I mean, as a side effect, they will live longer. But really, it's about health. Uh, and preventing disease. And so I, I, I think um, the field of aging is still relatively small compared to others, and I think the appreciation from the public for the science of aging is still modest, I think, when you compare it to other fields, like, you know, like cancer or infectious diseases and, and Alzheimer's disease and so on. So I think for someone who works on the basic biology of aging, um, I think we, we need to do a better job at that. Um, so, so in summary, I, I, I've told you that aging um, Unfortunately, it remains a mystery of biology. I mean, there are some theories. I, I would say, you know, if you put a gun to my head and tell me, you know, choose a theory of aging, I would say the DNA damage theory of aging would be the, the theory I'm more uh, comfortable accepting as, as a cause of aging, but it's not proven. Uh, so aging, I would say, remains a, a mystery of biology. Um, I've told you that, you know, genes regulate the aging process in animals, and that's, that's really been a break through in the field. There's over 2,000 genes in our genetic database. It's really is, um, I think it's a big um, breakthrough and revolution in the field is 
regulation of aging at the genetic level in short-lived uh, animal models. And I hope I'm persuaded that you know, network analysis and genomics, natural sequencing, all of these emerging technologies can lead to new insights, can lead to new candidates, new players uh, in aging, in caloric restriction, in longevity, in, in other diseases as well, um, that we can use these approaches to identify new processes and even new drugs um, that we can then follow up on. So I hope I persuade you at least to, to investigate those angles. And I mean, if you're interested, all right, one question I do tend to have quite a bit is, okay, I'm interested in doing network biology, but I mean, I'm not a bioinformatician. I mean, so I actually learned how to program a computer when I was, I, I don't know, seven or eight years old. So I've been programming computers since a fairly early age. Um, not everyone is like that. So if you're not, even if you're not familiar with computer programming, I mean, for, for a lot of these bioinformatics approaches, there are existing tools, and there are existing approaches that you can use for that. Um, you just download some software, and it's like learning another piece of software. So, and if you need any advice, just, just let me know. Um, I told you about you know, various drugs and diets that retard aging in animals, but there is still question marks of how applicable those are to human beings. I think that's still, to me, that's still a question mark. Um, my guess would be that some of what we're discovering, I mean, caloric restriction would be an example. I think it would be useful for some people, but not for others. It would probably be good in some genotypes, but not others. Um, and that is a big challenge in terms of translational, is figuring out where these particular interventions are going to be beneficial and when they might even be detrimental. Um, and lastly, I talked about the long lived species to find genes that uh, protect against aging, um, which is this, you know, I hope, complementary paradigm. To, uh, to traditional uh, biomedical model organisms. Um, so thank you very much. I, mean, I think I, I mentioned some of the people who did uh, do, do work, but I mean, so Michael did a lot of the analysis of the naked mole rat and bowhead whale genomes. And Thomas, um, he, did, he set up the naked mole rat uh, and bowhead whale genome resource, so he did set up the websites and he did a lot of work on our databases. Um, same for Jing Wei and Robbie. Um, Sean did the experiments in C. elegans uh, on testing the caloric restriction mimetics. Um, uh, so did Fabio. Um, so basically, you know, these are all the people who did the work that I'm telling you about. Um, and these are the various um, funding agencies that paid for the work that I've told you about. And thank you very much for your time and attention. and happy to answer any questions. Um, I'm not sure who, who, but I think you're the director here, so I'll, I'll go for you. I don't want to, I don't want to, to be upset with anyone else or with me, so uh, go ahead. It's a good question. We've actually, we have never looked at that uh, in a systematic fashion. Maybe we should have in our systematic analysis of the gerontome, but um, I guess there is some overlap in terms of the, you know, the, the, the known pathways, like the IGF-1, uh, uh, which is not IGF-1 in worms, but it's insulin uh, signaling. Um, so you do see some overlap, um, and I think there are some researcher biases. Um, having said that, I mean, in worms, I think there's 800 genes, and in mice, there's only 100 and something. I, I don't remember. So most of them will not, most of the genes in worms will not be in mice. But most of the genes in worms come from large-scale screens, and a lot of them haven't been followed up. So my guess is that there is some overlap, but there's also a lot of unique aspects. Now, how many of those in mice have not been studied in worms? I don't know. That's a good question. Hmm. Maybe we should look into that. I'll, I'll, I'll make a mental note on that. Oh, before I forget, let me just, so while you ask questions, I'll show you a video because we were talking about what we do to, uh, in outreach, this was a, a video done by uh, PhD Comics a couple of years ago about our work. Um, so we will just run. Um, um, any other questions? I Go ahead. Mm 
So they can get diseases. I mean, so Galapagos tortoises can get cancer. Um, I, I guess. I guess it depends. So I'll tell you what I know. So the best example I can think of are probably the studies in turtles, including painted turtles. So they do have predators, not just the cats in my house, but they have natural predators like. Um, um, I forgot to name, uh, but um, th they do have um, carnivores that prey on them. So, um, so they do have predators, and that would be the main cause of mortality in the wild for them. Um, whether, what do they die of in captivity is harder to say. They don't seem to die a lot, so the sample size would be very, very small. Um, so when you're looking at, again, at turtles, they can develop cancer, they can develop diseases. Um, but it's do sort of very, very low frequency. Um, then again, it is a, we don't know, because there's been very, very few studies. I mean, you could ask the same question of bow, bowhead whale. We don't know what bowhead whales die of. Uh, I think there's one case of a stranded bowhead whale who, who died of, um, I think it was a twisted intestine. That's one case of an uh, animal that we've been able to tell what he died of. Other than that, we don't know. We have no idea what bowhead whales are dying. Maybe they develop cancer, but they are able to fight it better than we do. Maybe they don't develop much cancer at all. We simply don't know. Um, so I, I think those are all big, interesting questions, but it's still open questions, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, well, in the bowhead whales, not really. And in the naked mullets, not really either. Um, as far, I'm not sure we know very well what naked mullets die of. I mean, they do have predators like snakes. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, uh, my understanding is that naked mullets, the primary cause of death is being bitten by the queen. Um, <laughs> that's, that's what people who work with them tell me. Um, but we know very little, again, about their causes of mortality. Um, as for commonalities, I would definitely argue that there is, they live in protected environments or they live in protected ecological niches. I mean, so bullhead whales are very big. So, well, the, the, the small ones, the, the young ones can be preyed upon by, um, by sharks, I believe, and killer whales. You know, a big bullhead whale has no natural predator, right? Um, likewise, naked mullets, they live underground. So they live in a much more protected environment. They do have predators, but they live in a low hazardous condition, let's call them that. Um, turtles have protective shells, and the Galapagos tortoise doesn't have any natural predators. So they all, or you know, bats, they can fly. So all of these animals, they live under ecological conditions that are beneficial, or not beneficial, that, um, that are low hazardous for different reasons, but they're low hazardous for different reasons. So, so that would be my, my guess. It's different routes to get there, but then it's, um, it's all driven by a low p hazard, low mortality rates. Um, so I think at the evolutionary perspective, we do have some level of understanding of why that happens. That, that, that's my impression, yes. You know, you'll have these species that either live in islands or live underground or grow very big or develop shells, and they become protected. They have low hazard rates. They can live a long time. So I think that's some level of understanding. I think at the molecular level, to me, that's the big question. You know, is that different mechanisms than the same mechanism? My intuition, and I could be completely wrong on this, is that different species use different tricks. Um, there will be some commonalities, but there will also be some unique aspects. So you know, why more rats pr are protected from cancer, or while bullhead whales or while, um, blind mole rats will be different. Um, but that's actually interesting because then if we can figure out all these mechanisms, that give us more in which we can intervene um, potentially uh, to improve human health. Let me stop my TED talk. But that's not my TED talk, but that's okay. <laughs> that's way cuter than my TED talk, I should say.
Go ahead. <laughs> 